uh, and throwing Bernie Del Rionda from yesterday as well. They do have a lot to think about. And how about Marco Mirren is bizarro case that the, the, the world's flipped upside down and it's the state presenting a reasonable doubt case to the jury. Again, more for them to think about. Janet Johnson uh, with us. Well, Janet, uh, some of your uh, reactions here to Marco Mirren, John Guy today. Yeah, well, I've known John Guy for about two decades, and this is the pinnacle of his career. I mean, it's the greatest he's ever done. I thought the two of them were just two craftsmen at the top of their game. You know, I think it was kind of hard for Marco Mera because he's actually comparing himself, I think, to Bernie Del Rionda from yesterday because he kept saying, I'm not going to yell at you, I'm not going to berate you, and I think that was effective. Had they been on the same day, I think that would have been more effective. But, you know, John came out and he didn't do any of those things. So it kind of was a contrast that I think was more favorable to the state because Bernie was a little bit, uh, I think, overly dramatic and I liked Omer kind of stepping it back and being more you know kind of calm about it but a lot of women let me tell you Mike on Twitter especially said I thought he was mansplaining and I thought he was condescending so even though I liked it a lot as a woman I think a lot of the women on the jury might be thinking why are you talking to me like this and if that's the case then John Guy may have gotten the upper hand Interesting. All right. Well, let's. You mentioned Marco Mera, and let's talk about some of. You know, he had them, those moments that you'll remember, and one of them is when he's talking. It was early on, talking about first impressions, and he even talked about their impression of George Zimmerman. Put his hand on his shoulder. Let's watch that. You can't help but have a first impression. Um, if I were to walk in today, let's say, you know, just as an example. Walked in like this. Just walked in the courtroom as a lawyer. You would just have an impression. What in God's name is he doing with his sunglasses on? And who does he think he is? What's with the pinky ring? I, I put that on because obviously this case has gotten some publicity. I became known as some pinky ring wearing attorney. It's actually my dad's high school ring. It's never been on my pinky. But that's all it takes is an impression. Um, and we look at people and we keep that with us. So you might have an impression of George Zimmerman. Stand for a second. Um, you might have an impression of him because he's sitting at the defense table. And that maybe as we talked about, he's not just a citizen accused, but maybe he is a defendant. Maybe he has something he has to defend. Maybe in fact that because the state attorney's office has decided to charge him, he has to have done something wrong. Maybe that's an impression that you have. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to ask you not to have impressions. That's absurd. My fear, as I was telling you about it, is that if that allows you to sort of diminish or minimize your task that you've taken on here, that it works against my client because when we, even when we talk about things like common sense, we want you to use your common sense, but be, be careful with your common sense. And I know it's a dangerous thing to say. Be careful with your common sense because common sense is the way we run our everyday lives, the way we make those snap decisions that we have to make every day in order to work, in order to live. Joe, you're... You Talk about the, that appeal to the jury. And he, before that, he talked about his fear of common sense and his fear of first impressions uh, in this case. Was that effective, the way he handled that? But he's a master at his craft. There's no question about that. The, however, the concern I had with it, if you look at impressions, who was the one in this case who formed the impression that led us to this day? And that's his client. And what impression was that based upon? A male walking in a neighborhood, walking aimlessly about in the rain, who happens to have a hoodie on? And so that, of course, can play a number of ways. I mean, none of us should be making judgments at anybody, whether they're wearing glasses, pinky rings, hoodies, you know, whether they're African American or otherwise, but it just was ironic to me in light of the backdrop of the case in terms of who made the biggest assumption and made and formulated an impression at the outset, that's George Zimmerman. In interesting point. Janet, weigh in on this. Amara's point, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you can't make assumptions. You can't fill in the blanks for the state who doesn't have a case, who hasn't proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, but get back to the hand on the shoulder and, and the first impressions, good or bad there. 
Well, we, I think it's Defense Attorney 101. I'm sure Joey's done it. I do it. I try to in every trial to sort of personify and put your arms around your client and say to the jury, he's not scary. I'm touching him. He can't be too frightening. John Guy picked up on that and he said, I'd love to put the arm around my victim, but mm -hmm. I can't because he's not here. But going back to Joey's point, I think that might have been something John Guy missed out on. He could have changed his closing, even though I think it was already prepared. And he could have gone up there and said, you know, I agree. First impressions are very dangerous. And that's why we're here today this first impression that was made by George Zimmerman or he thought was being made was wrong I think Joey would have done a better close I think that was a great point yeah it really was got, got us both thinking there obviously real quick you guys how hard is it to to flip on a dime like that in a 10 minute break and change your clothes for John Guy both of you real quick Joey start it's something that you have to do it's something that you need to do and it's something that you want to take the other person's words and you want to turn them into your own and supporting your theory of the case and so that's something that Janet does regularly it's something that I try to do and if you do it effectively <laughs> you know you're in good shape that's Janet, a how great challenging point. Yeah, I mean, is I it? Think it's challenging, but I think Joey, you know, as defense attorneys, we are probably more used to doing it because, you know, we're used to taking notes. We're used to, you know, kind of being the ones doing the cross and not the direct because our clients don't generally take the stand. We have more opportunity to cross-examine and to listen and to say, oh, he said this. I better change this question. The state doesn't do it as often because they don't do as many cross-examinations, even though they get the sandwich. So, you know, it's something he might have wanted to do and basically say, you know, I was listening. This is a point that was made. I have to address this. Got it. Okay, another point, and this is direct contrast here between how Mark O'Mara handled a time frame and how John Guy handled the time frame. For Mark O'Mara, we'll start there. Four minutes, and sitting in the courtroom, and, and he used the phone calls, what Trayvon Martin could have done in four minutes, and for four minutes, that courtroom went silent. So let, let, we'll play part of that, and we'll get uh, Janet and Joey's take on it. They dared to tell you that Trayvon Martin had no decisions, that my client planned this? Really, four minutes. Four minutes of planning. And they want you to ignore it. I guess, because if you don't ignore that, factual and undeniable innocence. Because with those four minutes, now let's use your common sense. Now let's decide what probably happened that night, because we know the result. Now let's try and figure out the why. George Zimmerman probably heading back to his car, looking with his little baby flashlight for Trayvon Martin a little bit. Maybe. Maybe. Not proven, but maybe. Trayvon Martin, four minutes, doing something. And we don't know. We really don't. We know he's on the phone, we know he's talking, we know what Rachel Gentel said he was saying about whatever he called him, and I don't care that he called him some stupid name, he's 17 years old. They get to talk stupidly if they want. I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with Rachel Gentel being 16 or 18 or whatever, who cares? She didn't want to be involved in this case. So there's, again, Mark O'Meara handling a four-minute time frame from a phone call that Rachel Gentel made until a time where she said she heard a thump, his contention, in four minutes, you could run a mile. Trayvon Martin could have gone home. On the other side, John Guy takes a two-minute time frame asking the question to the jury, what was George Zimmerman doing? Let's watch. The defense attorney gave us a nice demonstration of what happens in four minutes. Well, what was that defendant doing for those two minutes? Watch the walkthrough again. Watch it. When he, because he, he, he tells you exactly where he hung up. He's walking back in the direction of the T, and he says, I got off the phone and I continued to my car. Maybe, maybe 10 seconds before he got to the T. It was. Two minutes. Two minutes. He wasn't going back to his car. There you go. Each attorney so adept at handling these time frames, giving the jury something to think about. By the way, speaking of the jury, jury instructions coming up any moment now. And before we know it, they will have the case, and we will be on a verdict watch here at HLN. Back with us are uh, great criminal defense attorneys, Janet Johnson, Joey Jackson. 
Janet, who won that? You know, battle of the time frame, uh, you know, and I'll start with O'Mara being in the courtroom for that, and he let that courtroom go silent for four minutes, and I know that is a tactic we've seen before as well in, well, as well in some right. cases. That's a long time, and you get a little fidgety out there, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, I didn't love that. You know, now it's not to say suggesting that he could have ran a four-minute mile. I thought was not that great because not that many people run a four-minute mile. You know, and I also think he didn't have, he only has three hours to work with to give up four minutes of that time to silence. I don't think is that great a, a tactic. And I thought John was able to flip it around and say it takes less than that to go to your car, and that's all he had to do. I, I didn't think that was a win for O'Mara. I think that was a point that John was able to get from him. Got it. Joey, you agree with that in the battle of the time frames? You're giving it to John Guy? Well, you know, ultimately, it's what the jury agrees with or they don't. And in any case, what happens, Mike, is that you take the same facts, the same evidence, but you spin it in a different way. The defense wants you to focus on Trayvon Martin's opportunity to have avoided the entire issue. He could have been home. He could have gotten where he belonged. This shouldn't have ever happened. But it's his fault it did. He's saying that by implication. And then, of course, it did happen. We know what happened. The prosecution reminds you that it happened because George Zimmerman allowed it to happen. And what did he do within those two minutes? And so it's the same evidence being marshaled in another way and different portions of the evidence being focused on. But who would assist? That's up to the jury. Yeah, well put. Yeah, and again, you mentioned the jury. Jury instructions coming up very soon, and that jury's going to have the case, and we will be on a verdict watch here at HLN. This intense trial coming to a close. You're watching every moment here on HLN.